So as a continuation of our, our breakfast series, I'm pleased to introduce our, our guest uh, speaker this morning, uh, Federal Reserve Governor Leo Brainard. Governor Brainard uh, took office as a member of the Board of, of Governors of the Federal Reserve uh, System on June 16, 2014 to fill um, an unexpired uh, term ending uh, January 31st, 2026. Uh, prior to her uh, appointment to the board, she served as Undersecretary of the U.S. Department of Treasury from 2010 to 2013 and Counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury in 2009. Uh, during this time, uh, she was the U.S. Representative of the G20 Finance uh, Deputies and uh, G7 uh, Deputies and was a member of the Financial Stability Board. Uh, and she received the Alexander Hamilton Award uh, for her service. From 2001 to 2008, um, Governor Brainerd was uh, Vice President and Founding Director of the Global Economy and Development Program and uh, held the Bernard Schwartz uh, Chair at the Brookings Institute uh, where she built a new research program uh, to address global economic challenges. She served as the Deputy National Economic Advisor and Deputy Assistant to uh, President Clinton. Uh, she also served as President Clinton's personal representative uh, to G7, G8. From 1990 to 1996, um, the governor was Assistant uh, and Associate Professor of Applied Economics uh, at MIT's Sloan School of Management. Uh, she was a, has, has published numerous articles um, on a variety of economic subjects uh, and is the uh, editor or co-editor of several books as well. Uh, previously, she worked for McKinsey and Company. She received her uh, BA uh, with University Honors from uh, Wesleyan uh, University in uh, 1983 and an MS and PhD in economics um, in, uh, from Harvard University uh, where she was awarded the uh, National Science Foundation Fellowship. She also was a White House uh, fellow. After we uh, hear from, uh, governor, uh, from the governor, we will uh, uh, take questions. I'll moderate, the, moderate those questions. And as always, um, we look forward to, to your participation. And uh, for the record, uh, this, is, this is on the record. Uh, for the, for, and we do have press in the back of the room. And with that, I'll turn it over to Governor Brenner. Well, it's, uh, it's great to be here, and uh, I really appreciate the kind introduction, Terry, and the kind invitation uh, from uh, Barbara and Terry as well. Overall, the U.S. economy remains on solid footing against the backdrop of the first synchronized global growth we've seen in some time and accommodative financial conditions. The benign outlook is clouded somewhat by uncertainties uh, surrounding government funding and the fiscal outlook and geostrategic risk has risen. While the heartbreaking human toll exacted by Hurricane Harvey is already all too clear, it will take some time to assess the macroeconomic impact. The labor market continues to bring more Americans off the sidelines and back into productive employment, which is very welcome. In contrast, there's a notable disconnect between signs that the economy is in the neighborhood of full employment and a string of below uh, expected inflation readings, especially since inflation has come in substantially and stubbornly below target for five years now. With normalization of the federal funds rate underway and the start of gradual balance sheet normalization widely anticipated, I'll want to take some time to assess the path of the federal funds rate that will best support a sustainable move in inflation to our 2% goal. So let me start by reviewing uh, the outlook. Uh, the welcome, uh, we, we have seen one welcome development in the noteworthy pickup in business investment this year compared with last year. Investment in equipment and intellectual property has risen at an annual rate of 6% so far after remaining roughly flat this year. And oil drilling had rebounded this year after dropping sharply last year, although Hurricane Harvey creates some uncertainty about the coming months. Following lackluster consumer spending in the first quarter, uh, growth in personal consumption expenditures bounced back strongly in the second quarter, and recent readings on retail sales suggest another solid increase this quarter. 
The likely economic effects of Hurricane Harvey, of course, raise uncertainties about the outlook going forward. Based on past experiences, it appears likely that the hurricane will have a notable effect on GDP in the current quarter, with output likely to rebound by the end of the year. According to the Department of Energy, between 20 and 30 percent of the nation's oil refining capacity was shut down at the peak last week, as was about 50 percent of petrochemical production. Some oil production has also been disrupted. And of course, we've already seen upward pressure on gasoline prices. Based on previous hurricanes, the increase in gasoline prices should be short-lived, but that will depend on the extent of damage to refining capacity. Turning to our dual mandate, the labor market has continued to improve. According to last Friday's report, over the last three months, non-farm payrolls have increased at about the same average monthly pace as last year, and the unemployment rate has been roughly flat for the past several months at 4.4 percent, which is a half percentage point lower than at the same time last year. The employment to population ratio for prime age workers, which is a more complete picture, has also improved over the past year, although it's still two percentage points below its pre-crisis peak. Earlier this year, many observers saw the prospect of fiscal stimulus as presenting the possibility of a, su a substantial boost to domestic demand. Since then, however, many commentators have downgraded their assessments of the extent and timing of fiscal stimulus, and I have to say I've revised my outlook as well. That said, we are seeing synchronized global economic growth for the first time in many years, as foreign economies such as Canada, the Euro area, and China are posting robust GDP growth. And this improvement has been reflected here at home in dollar depreciation, higher earnings in stock prices, tighter risk spreads, and an increase in net exports, which made a small positive contribution in the first half this year after holding down GDP growth over the past several years. Despite this benign picture for the overall economy and continued labor market improvements, core PCE inflation slowed by almost one half percentage point relative to the pace a year ago. Indeed, both overall and core inflation were only 1.4 percent for the year through July, well short of the FOMC's objective. So to what extent does it make sense to look through these recent low inflation readings as transitory? It does appear that temporary factors such as discounted cell phone plans are pushing down inflation to some extent this year, just as other temporary factors, for instance, prescription drug prices likely boosted inflation last year. Going forward, we should also see a temporary boost to headline inflation due to Harvey's effect on gasoline prices, as I noted earlier. Temporary factors, by their very nature, have little implication for the underlying trend in inflation. But temporary factors cannot explain the five straight years that we've seen in which inflation fell short of our target despite a sharp improvement in resource utilization. So let's uh, put this in perspective, perhaps, by comparing inflation in the past few years with the last time the economy was in the neighborhood of full employment just before the financial crisis. Unemployment averaged roughly 5% over the past three years, just as it did over the three years ending in early 2000. Despite the similarity, core inflation averaged 2.2% from 2004 to 2007, notably higher than the comparable three-year inflation rate today of 1.5%. The fact that the period from 2004 to 2007 had inflation around target with similar unemployment rates casts some doubt on the likelihood that resource utilization is the primary explanation for lo today's lower inflation. Similarly, a 12-quarter average is typically a long enough time that temporary factors should not be the dominant difference. One key factor that does differentiate the two periods is uh, the um, decline in import prices uh, in recent years, reflecting the dollar surge, especially in 2015. By contrast, in the 2004 to 2007 period, non-oil import prices increased at roughly a 2 percent annual rate and, and therefore were somewhat neutral on inflation. Nonetheless, while the decline in uh, non-oil import prices likely accounts for some of the weakness in inflation over the past few years, 
these prices have begun rising again in the last year, and inflation remains notably low. So if import prices, resource utilization, and transitory factors together don't provide a completely satisfactory account, why has inflation been so much lower in the past few years than it was previously? In many of the models economists use to analyze inflation, a key feature is underlying or trend inflation, which is believed to anchor the rate of inflation over a fairly long horizon. Underlying inflation can be thought of as the slow-moving trend that exerts a strong pull on wage and price setting and is related to longer-run inflation expectations. There's no single highly reliable measure of underlying trend inflation or longer-run inflation expectations. Nonetheless, a variety of measures suggest underlying trend inflation may current be, currently be lower than it was before the crisis, contributing to the ongoing shortfall from our objective. For instance, let's start with time series models. One model that's been used by a variety of researchers suggests that underlying trend inflation may have moved down by perhaps as much as a half percentage point over the past decade. Market-based measures of inflation compensation suggest a similar decline in expectations. Comparing the three-year period ending in the second quarter of this year with a three-year period just before the financial crisis, 10-year ahead, inflation compensation based on tips yields is three-quarters percentage point lower. Survey-based measures of inflation expectations are also lower. The Michigan survey measure of median household expectations of inflation over the next five to 10 years suggests a one-quarter percentage point downward shift. And uh, that is similar to the five-year, five-year forward CPI forecast from the Survey of Professional Forecasters. So why might underlying inflation expectations have moved down since the financial crisis? One simple explanation may be that households and firms have experienced a prolonged period of inflation below our objective, and that may be affecting their perception of underlying inflation. A related explanation may be the greater proximity to the effective lower bound due to uh, a, lo a lower neutral rate of interest currently. By constraining the policy space or the conventional policy space available to offset adverse developments, the low neutral rate could increase the likely frequency of periods uh, below trend inflation uh, and therefore lead to lower expectations. So given this recent disconnect between robust employment and weak inflation readings, how should the FOMC achieve its dual mandate goals? Some might determine that preemptive tightening is appropriate on the grounds that monetary policy notoriously operates with long lags and inflation will inevitably accelerate because of the Phillips curve as the labor market continues to tighten. However, in today's economy, there are reasons to worry the Phillips curve will not prove very reliable in boosting inflation because the Phillips curve appears to be flatter today than previously. Since 2012, inflation has changed relatively little as the unemployment rate has fallen from 8.2% to 4.4%. This flatness is also apparent in a number of advanced foreign economies. Given a relatively flat Phillips curve, it should take a, or it could take a considerable undershooting of the natural rate of unemployment to achieve our inflation objective if we rely on this relationship with resource utilization alone. For all of these reasons, achieving our inflation target on a sustainable basis is likely to require a firming in longer run inflation expectations, that is in the underlying trend. The key question in my mind is how to achieve such an improvement in longer run inflation expectations to a level that will allow us to sustainably achieve our target. The persistent failure to meet our objective should push us to think broadly about both diagnoses and solutions. The academic literature suggests a variety of prescriptions for preventing a lower neutral rate of interest from eroding longer run inflation expectations. One feature that's common to many of those proposals is that the persistence of the shortfall in inflation from our objective should be one of the considerations in setting monetary policy. That brings me to the implications uh, for monetary policy. A key upcoming decision for the committee is when to commence balance sheet normalization. I consider normalization of the federal funds rate to be well underway, the criterion for commencing balance sheet normalization. The approaching change to our reinvestment policy has been clearly communicated and is well anticipated. 
In principle, the FOMC could use both the balance sheet and the federal funds rate as active tools for setting monetary policy. However, I view the federal funds rate as the preferred active tool. Its effect on financial conditions and the economy has been more effect extensively tested and is far better understood. As a result, once we set in motion the change in balance sheet policy, as long as the economy evolves broadly as expected, we should allow the balance sheet to run off in the background at the gradual pace that was announced. We would primarily look to ongoing adjustments in the federal funds rate to calibrate the stance of monetary policy as those economic conditions evolve. Once balance sheet normalization is underway, I'll be looking closely at the evolution of inflation before making a determination about further adjustments to the federal funds rate. Because we've been falling short of our inflation objective, not just in the past year, but over a longer period as well, we should be cautious about tightening policy further until we're confident that inflation is on track to achieve our target. Unless we expect inflation to move quickly back to our target, or there are indications that the short-run neutral rate of interest has moved up further, a variety of estimates suggest we could approach neutral without too many additional rate increases. Many forecasters assume the neutral rate of interest is very low currently, and it is likely to be low relative to historical norms in the longer run. The Laubach-Williams model currently suggests an estimate of the longer run neutral funds rate that is actually slightly below zero. And in the most recent summary of economic projections, the median longer run nominal federal funds rate is about 3%, which implies the long run real federal funds rate would be only 1% under those estimates, lower than its average in the previous decades of around 2.5%. Those estimates suggest the neutral rate of interest is likely to rise only modestly in the medium term. It's worth remembering in addition that the Federal Reserve's balance sheet policy may reinforce this tendency over the next several years. A recent study suggests balance sheet runoff could boost the level of the term premium on the 10-year Treasury yield by about 40 basis points over the first few years. Typical rules of thumb suggest that such an increase in term premiums would imply a decrease in the short-run neutral rate of interest. Although, of course, the FOMC expects to begin normalizing its balance sheet relatively soon, several foreign central banks are continuing purchases of longer-term assets. Because these longer-term government securities and the major economies are close substitutes, this will likely to continue to exert some countervailing pressure on U.S. longer-term interest rates. But with growth abroad strengthening, there are indications that it may not be too long before central banks in several major economies could also begin normalizing monetary policy, ending their net purchases, and eventually beginning to reduce their balance sheets. As this happens, the current downward pressure on longer-term interest rates from foreign spillovers will begin to abate. For these reasons, my current expectation is that the short-run neutral rate of interest may not rise much over the medium term, but this is an open question, and it bears monitoring. To the extent that the neutral rate remains low relative to its historical value, there's a high premium on guiding inflation back up to target in order to retain space to buffer adverse shocks with conventional policy. In this regard, it's important to be clear that we would be comfortable with inflation moving modestly above our target for a time, as is implied by the symmetric language in the committee's longer-run policy statement. Finally, it's worth considering the possible implications of a sustained period of low neutral rates and low unemployment for financial imbalances. Historically, extended periods with very low unemployment tend to be associated with below average period spreads of expected returns on risky assets over safe interest rates. Although to some extent low premiums, low risk premiums and rising asset valuations may be consistent with strong fundamentals, such as low default rates, and strong corporate earnings, there have also been times when a strong economy and low unemployment have led to overvaluation of asset prices, underpricing of risk, and growing financial imbalances. So in today's environment, uh, I, I think it's extremely important to be vigilant to the signs that asset valuations appear to be elevated, especially in areas such as in commercial real estate and corporate bonds, as well as to the exceptionally low levels of expected volatility. Nonetheless, there are a few signs of a dangerous buildup of leverage or of maturity transformation, which is due in no small measure to the improvements in capital, liquidity, and risk management 
made by the financial institutions at the core of our system, which are associated with post-crisis financial reforms, as well as with money market reform and the greater transparency in the derivatives markets. So to sum up, much rises, uh, much uh, rides on the evolution of inflation going forward. If as many forecasters assume the current shortfall of inflation from our 2% objective indeed proves transitory, further gradual increases in the federal funds rate would be warranted perhaps along the lines of the median projection from the most recent summary of economic projections. But to the extent that the recent low readings for inflation may be driven by depressed underlying inflation, this would imply a more persistent shortfall from our objective, which would argue for moving more gradually. We should have substantially more data in hand in the coming months that will help us make that assessment. So that concludes my remarks, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, Governor. We'll take uh, questions. Um, Brooke, do you have a question? We, we, we're going to throw it out, throw it out to our fellows uh, first. I just, I was just was saying thank you, Terry, but I'll defer to the group. Okay, thanks, <laughs> thanks very much. Well, let me ask the first question, just about uh, unemployment. It did, it is very low, of course, but it did have, it did tick up during the last reporting cycle with fewer jobs added than than expected. Any concerns about that as we uh, move forward? So I, I would anticipate that we will see some effects, uh, in particular from Hurricane Harvey, uh, in the payrolls uh, reports. Um, but we expect those to be, or at least I expect those to be somewhat short-lived. Overall, the um, labor market picture, I think, is a very positive one. Um, we're, we're continuing to see uh, margins of slack uh, diminishing. And so in the last report, even though unemployment um, did tick up a small amount. Um, we also saw some uh, uh, welcome improvements uh, in part-time uh, for economic reasons uh, coming down. We've uh, seen discouraged workers coming back in uh, to the workforce. So uh, it does suggest that there may still be some, some margins of slack, as uh, does the still a low level of overall uh, employment uh, to population ratio for prime age workers, which really um, controls for some of the demographic shifts, which is still a noticeable 2% below where it was before the crisis. Okay. Um, sure, let's start in the back and we'll come to you. First of all, I appreciate your remarks very much. Uh, the inputs to inflation of labor and capital seem to be offset more and more by technology. And uh, when you look at the, uh, for example, the big three automakers, their revenues are identical to the revenues of the FANG stocks, but the FANG stocks represent one-tenth of the employees of the big three companies and represent 50 times more than market cap. So the question I have is, is the ability to measure inflation in the context of a technological disruptive period such that you can't really measure the deflationary effects going on from the internet and other technological innovations going on? So, so I think the uh, question that you raise about um, do we fully understand um, the impact of technological innovation on uh, how inflation uh, is measured and really what those measures represent um, is, a, is a very important question. I think there's a lot of um, discussions, a lot of research going on in this area at the moment. Um, it's certainly the case uh, that the mechanisms we have or that the BLS uses, for instance, for undertaking quality adjustments uh, as products change over time or when new products are introduced, um, that there are some complicated measurement um, uh, issues there. Um, and so uh, this is an area that uh, bears close watching. It uh, may well be impacting, for instance, uh, our, our measured productivity. Uh, there may be a difference between what we're measuring in terms of productivity and what uh, the underlying rate of productivity uh, growth actually is. It's not clear whether those differences are greater now than they may have been, for instance, you know, in the uh, late 90s uh, when we also saw a big surge of technological innovation. Um, but the relationship between innovation, technological innovation, wage setting, and uh, inflation, I think, is one that we need to continue to pay very close attention to. Yes, table six. 
Yes, thank you. Um, my question is regarding the normalization of the balance sheet. Um, academics, researchers, and even on occasion Federal Reserve Banks have blogged that the growth in the Fed balance sheet has exacerbated income inequality in the United States. And um, uh, first of all, I'd like to ask, while income inequality is not one of your dual mandates, do you consider that? And do you agree or disagree with that assertion or that, 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 those, um, those, re that piece, those pieces of research? And secondly, as you are, uh, the Federal Reserve has indicated that it will lead the balance sheet normalization with um, the mortgage side of the balance sheet. And do you have any concerns that by doing so, you may be limiting um, housing finance availability for the middle class? So um, the questions about um, uh, income and wealth inequality in the U.S. and how do they figure into policymakers' uh, thinking, um, clearly, uh, at least in my own mind, uh, I pay very close attention um, to uh, the trends uh, in income distribution, in part uh, because I think uh, they matter uh, for the robustness and the resilience of our economy. Um, because they matter for the uh, who's who is receiving uh, the bulk of the income uh, and the, and their uh, likelihood of spending that may be quite different. So it does matter as we think about the overall resilience of the economy. It certainly mattered uh, going into the crisis um, where uh, the uh, financial uh, health and stability of households at the lower end of the income distribution uh, mattered for the overall stability of the system. Um, do I think, uh, have I seen uh, evidence that the balance sheet may in some uh, respect be contributing to that? I think these are very um, long-standing trends um, and uh, those trends uh, long predate uh, the use of uh, unconventional monetary policy in the U.S., the asset purchases, um, and uh, they, uh, I believe, have um, much uh, deeper um, causes. Uh, this goes back to some of the technological questions that were asked earlier. And uh, the, the, the uh, sets of policies that are appropriate to address them are, are really well outside the realm of uh, the Federal Reserve's um, tools or, or uh, the specific objectives uh, that Congress has set us. Um, with regard to the um, balance sheet uh, normalization plans that the FOMC uh, has agreed, um, as you know, uh, the uh, balance sheet runoff um, has specific caps that are set separately uh, for treasuries and for MBS. Um, in my own view, those uh, are set and are uh, increase over time uh, gradually and in a way uh, that should be well anticipated um, and that will uh, give the uh, ample uh, space for private markets to uh, be able to uh, fund uh, those uh, securities going forward. So I think that the plans that uh, were announced uh, were uh, took into consideration uh, a number of important um, uh, characteristics uh, and uh, do uh, carefully uh, and gradually and predictably allow uh, the balance sheet to, to run off in a way that should really uh, be uh, well anticipated and well managed by the markets. About number two, uh, table ten over there, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Terry. Governor, thank you for sharing your insights with us and also thank you for your long standing service. Um, coming out of Jackson Hole, Baldas from BGD Holdings. Coming out of Jackson Hole, and you just echoed it also right now, that when you look at the reforms that were put in place in the aftermath of the financial crisis, whether it was capital, liquidity, risk management, derivatives market, uh, transparency, or money market uh, reforms, overall they have contributed, this is the finding coming out of Jackson Hole, and you repeated it, towards uh, the sustained economic growth that we are seeing. I am curious if within the Federal Reserve you have also done any studies that you could speak to in terms of the hampering effect or the dampening effect on the animal spirits, which is a structural component of powering risk-taking and growth. I'd be curious if any studies have been done 
to the counterfactual, not to what you're speaking to. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Um, I think uh, that there's been a lot of work done uh, both uh, in by policy researchers as well as academic researchers, uh, uh, both focused on the U.S. only as well as uh, on uh, the international financial system, um, uh, asking the question as to whether um, asking the largest, most systemic, most complex institutions to hold um, uh, more robust uh, capital buffers to stress test uh, those capital buffers um, to better risk weight uh, the assets uh, that they're holding um, those uh, buffers against to better manage their liquidity and to better risk manage, whether that may in some respects uh, impede um, uh, the flow of credit uh, to the economy. Um, uh, now, animal spirits is a somewhat uh, different question, although I think um, uh, we've seen a very uh, robust reading, certainly, uh, of confidence in, in of, of consumers and more broadly. Um, with regard to credit, um, you know, if you look in the U.S. economy, um, credit is flowing. Uh, credit uh, is uh, really very available by um, in all of our uh, surveys that we've undertaken uh, recently, uh, you would be hard pressed to find um, uh, cases where uh, credit is not readily available to uh, qualified uh, borrowers. Um, and uh, standards in some cases have been uh, tightened, but those in those instances, I think um, we had first seen a bit of a deterioration in, in underwriting standards, for instance, um, uh, in CRE. Um, so my sense is that um, for the institutions at the core of the system, uh, their ability to lend um, uh, has actually um, been supported uh, by the rigorous reforms they've undertaken. Now, uh, I think there are some institutions um, who uh, uh, the community banks or smaller banks in particular um, who, uh, by virtue of the way that um, the statute is written, uh, got caught up in some of the reforms um, that perhaps uh, are not uh, necessary or useful for their particular business models. And there, you know, I think there is a scope uh, for statutory changes. And here I'm thinking about Volcker or incentive comp or stress testing, depending on what the size and the complexity of that institution is. So do I think there are also ways that we could um, right-size those um, regulations, uh, absolutely, uh, and that it would allow smaller uh, financial institutions, uh, supervised institutions in particular, um, to, uh, to be uh, more active in lending. Uh, so I, I hope uh, that there will be an opportunity to make some of those changes. Thank you for a very interesting talk, particularly on inflation. For most of your comments, I haven't heard that much on inflation from a Fed person for a long time. We've had about 20 years of experience now with inflation index bonds. And one of the principal arguments uh, in bringing, bringing them out, not the only one, that they've been used, modestly useful in asset management, but also the information content, the wisdom of the market would show us uh, where inflation was headed, and uh, could you comment on how uh, you appraise the usefulness of that, that asset class? So I can't uh, appraise it from an investor's point of view, um, uh, it, but I can say that um, when uh, we are trying to gauge inflation expectations and we're looking at um, market-based measures, um, that uh, that uh, asset class proves extremely important because we look at the difference between um, inflation uh, treasury uh, yields and uh, non-inflation index to try to get a sense of what kind of probabilities the markets uh, are, are placing on um, inflation coming in above target, inflation coming in uh, below target over different horizons. Now, um, and we also look at other market-based measures, but that, that is one of the key measures that we look at. And uh, of course, there are different liquidity uh, characteristics in those markets. Um, and so, you know, it's not a straight read uh, on expectations. I don't take it as such. I don't think any of us do. 
Um, but it is one useful indicator, along with a host of other indicators, some survey-based, uh, some model-based, that does uh, help us um, gauge uh, whether, in fact, uh, there may be some um, change in inflation expectations, and certainly based on um, the, uh, the, those markets, it does appear, in fact, that um, market participants are putting a somewhat lower probability on high inflation outcomes and a somewhat greater uh, probability on low inflation outcomes, and it suggests that, in fact, there has been a noticeable change uh, in inflation expectations, a, a decline uh, since the pre-crisis pre period, and it's certainly something um, that I that I've focused on over the last uh, few years. Thank you very much. Uh, where do you stand on a debate um, in the FOMC currently on financial conditions? Uh, it seems to me that uh, wanting to wait for inflation to be in the rear view mirror runs the risk of running a monetary policy that is very accommodative for maybe t longer than necessary and in the meantime boosts asset prices to levels that might be of concern. So wouldn't you agree, like the one participant mentioned in the last uh, minutes, that um, continuing to hike as per the dots uh, would strike the right balance between achieving the inflation mandate and guarding off against risks from too loose financial conditions. Thank you. So um, I think financial conditions are an extremely important consideration uh, for all of us as we uh, look at uh, the appropriate path of monetary policy, in particular um, when financial conditions ease, uh, uh, that uh, contributes um, to a stronger economy, may well contribute um, to a more robust outlook for inflation. Um, and so it's certainly something that uh, materially factors into the outlook. Um, the separate question is whether we should be um, undertaking monetary policy to target uh, financial conditions. And there, I think you uh, can also see in previous um, minutes of FOMC discussions that there's been quite a bit of um, discussion, robust discussion, where um, the, uh, the minutes will suggest that people um, generally uh, in the committee believe that um, we have uh, other tools um, that are our first line of defense uh, against a buildup of financial imbalances and that the tools that we have in the wake of the crisis are much, much more robust uh, than we had going into the crisis. Moreover, we have a much more systematic and rigorous um, a quarterly review uh, of uh, uh, potential financial imbalances, potential financial stability concerns, so that the board, um, which uh, is responsible for, for most of those non-monetary policy tools, and the FOMC in turn um, now have regular and uh, systematic looks at financial stability. So while it is something um, that I think is a concern, and uh, I have noted in previous remarks that in the past two episodes uh, when unemployment uh, reached uh, very low levels, it was in fact um, financial imbalances that were the primary concern. Um, uh, rather than um, accelerating inflation. Uh, again, though, uh, we have generally taken the view that uh, monetary policy should not be the first line of defense, and that's why the robust um, macroprudential tools that we have uh, as a result of Dodd-Frank um, and tools such as the countercyclical buffer, uh, which is now um, a, a tool uh, that is uh, also out there that we can use um, have been so important uh, to our ability to focus monetary policy on the dual mandate. Yeah. First of all, very humbly, thank you also for your service. I had um, two questions, if that's okay. Um, the first revolving around the uh, uh, balance sheet. When and if the announcement comes, how do you view further announcements of the reduction versus FOMC um, hiking interest rates? So if the reduction is, for example, X, and then it's done a second time, at what point would you revisit then um, hiking the Fed funds rate? And the second question was, you mentioned the 40 basis points of term premium 
Um, I was just curious how, how, if there's a certain quantity or how you guys think about that. If, for example, after the first announcement, is that viewed as, let's say, a five basis point tightening? Um, just any color that you're comfortable sharing. So I think the first important thing to uh, just say is that the uh, plans that were agreed uh, by the FOMC um, essentially lay out um, a path um, for uh, the balance sheet uh, on uh, both uh, types of securities um, that is, uh, once it is initiated, um, uh, is essentially, uh, can be thought of as going on autopilot, uh, that it's completely laid out, um, that it is capped, uh, and of course there's uh, complete transparency around the SOMA portfolio so that market participants will be able to uh, correctly anticipate exactly how that balance sheet runoff will proceed. Now there um, was, and again let me just say my own view uh, is that uh, we know so much about how the federal funds rate works. We have uh, decades of experience um, tons of uh, empirical estimates, and really um, uh, most of the estimates that we have regarding asset purchases are very recent and uh, were in uh, the uh, midst of a, a large protracted um, period of um, you know, economic um, challenges, um, so that it, it does not provide as much um, predictability um, to the public. Uh, so that my preferred instrument, my preferred active instrument, I think this is consistent with the um, plans that were laid out by the FOMC, uh, would be to use the federal funds rate um, and to calibrate that to economic conditions as they evolve. Now, of course, there is um, some, uh, some consideration uh, in those plans, and it certainly would be true of my own thinking that if uh, the economy were to evolve very differently, if we were to see uh, large adverse developments at that juncture, uh, there may be some uh, reason uh, to uh, slow or change uh, the balance sheet uh, runoff policy, but that would be uh, under very uh, different circumstances. Um, so that was your first question. Um, let me see, was there a second question? Oh, so the term premium, yeah. So the, the one thing I would say is those estimates, too, they're out in the public domain. Um, they are uh, primarily based on uh, event studies uh, during uh, periods of asset purchases. Whether um, those estimates are the uh, uh, appropriate, you know, sort of uh, neighborhood um, uh, uh, of magnitudes uh, during a period of runoff, I think it's an open question. They, they give us some sense of what uh, we might expect to see in terms of the term premium, but I think um, it's fair to say, at least in my mind, that um, those estimates um, are uh, t come from a sufficiently different period that I don't know, and I will be watching um, very carefully, I'm sure everyone else will be as well, to see whether um, the effects uh, differ in, uh, materially enough that it may have implications for how to think about the federal funds rate right path. Uh, but at least going into it, um, those, are the, those are some of the um, at least most uh, well understood uh, estimates that are out there. Uh, yes, right here. I also thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Neely Gilbert, uh, co-founder and portfolio manager at Materin Capital. Um, you have a great deal of expertise in the fields of globalization and trade, not only from the, your academic research, but also as a practitioner, uh, for example, your time in the Treasury. Uh, I wonder, how would um, uh, proposed or existing changes in U.S. trade policy uh, arising from the rise of uh, populism uh, affect the way that you are thinking about uh, achieving your goals uh, as a Fed governor, um, whether, for example, uh, its impact on the labor market, uh, impact on the dollar, uh, how those things could drive inflation or other effects? So I would say that uh, generally, um, the, to the extent that um, you know there are big policies uh, that are uh, you know it's being enacted um, of any sort, um, uh, we would want to take into account um, 
to the extent one could estimate the impact on our dual mandate, that would obviously um, be uh, a conditioning factor in how we think about the appropriate path of policy. Um, to, from where I sit today, um, you know, the economy actually looks, um, as I said earlier, uh, growth is continuing. Um, uh, trade flows have actually improved a bit. Um, net exports are making a positive, small positive contribution for the first time in several years. Um, and so, you know, that now there, there could be some disruptions associated with Harvey, but generally speaking, the policy environment uh, that uh, we're taking into account has some fiscal uncertainty about it, but really those, um, some geostrategic uncertainty, but those would be the main sources of uncertainty as I think about um, the policy arena um, and, um, and that the implications uh, for um, monetary policy. You know, if we were to see uh, different kinds of policy shifts uh, in the future, obviously those are ones uh, that I would take into account at that time. My thanks also for joining us. Um, you've mentioned several times uh, the happy condition of growth occurring elsewhere in the world simultaneously. Could you say a bit more about how durable you see those external sources of growth as well as the risks that are drawn to your attention? Yeah, so, um, so what we uh, have seen is after um, several years of um, the uh, IMF and others having to mark down global uh, growth forecasts. What we have recently seen is actually the IMF and others marking up global uh, growth forecasts. And uh, this is on the back of uh, stronger growth in uh, several of our uh, major um, economies uh, around the world uh, around the same time. So obviously the Euro area um, activity and uh, labor market um, uh, readings have come in somewhat stronger than anticipated, um, and that's very welcome. Um, uh, Japan has recently come in a bit stronger, Canada, and then China. Now, of course, there are risks to those outlooks, but I, uh, a year ago, uh, would have said that a major downside risk to our outlook uh, really came from abroad, and I would say uh, today, that balance of risk has really shifted. Um, in China, uh, in the medium term, I think there are uh, risks associated with um, the trajectory of growth. We've seen a rapid uh, buildup of corporate debt in particular. We've seen um, some uh, house price um, uh, uh, increases in areas um, uh, and um, we, uh, I think, would anticipate that the underlying trend growth rate is going to come down over time, and how um, uh, the authorities manage um, to uh, deal with uh, those financial imbalances while also converging on a sustainable growth path is, is something that I think uh, could be a risk for the medium term. We know that we have some um, changes uh, in the relationship between Britain and the EU that are um, being discussed, and so that uh, has some uh, medium-term risks uh, to the global outlook as well. Um, and as I said earlier, there's some geostrategic risks out there, but the core um, growth outlook has improved really quite notably um, over the last uh, two, two years um, in a way that I think uh, now is contributing positively uh, to the U.S. economy, which is extremely welcome. Thank you. My, my question is to pull back from the micro and to ask you what you think the role of monetary policy should be eight and a half years into an economic expansion. And you, you laid out a scenario where perhaps the suppressed rate of inflation is a global phenomenon, perhaps outside the direct impact of the Fed, and that the preferred policy tool is the Fed funds rate. So my question is, when is it appropriate for the Fed to perhaps shift its focus from trying to fine tune the rate of inflation to building in protection or building in enough room for monetary policy to have a real impact on the economy the next time it falls into recession? 
So I think um, it's a very tricky question um, uh, to ask if, in fact, uh, the neutral rate uh, has come down and is likely to remain uh, low for some time. And uh, as I said earlier, I think um, there are a variety of reasons uh, to believe that it is low currently and that it's likely to remain low for some time. In those circumstances, um, the uh, room for maneuver uh, above our effective lower bound using conventional policy is inherently limited. Um, and so, uh, you know, as a monetary policy maker, um, you're, uh, you, you know, you, you've got a very clear objective of achieving sustainably the dual mandate, full employment, um, and 2% uh, uh, inflation on a sustainable basis. Um, and so that is the, the guidepost for our policy. Um, now, it's actually more important than ever uh, that we get to that symmetric 2% inflation goal if, in fact, the neutral rate is lower um, because uh, that gives us uh, the, as much uh, room uh, as we're going likely, future monetary policymakers are likely to have um, in terms of being able to buffer adverse shocks uh, above uh, the effective lower bound. So I think the real uh, underlying question is, you know, if we are in fact in a low neutral rate environment and are likely to be for some time, achieving that 2% goal uh, is more important than ever. And the question is, um, you know, how do we get uh, from here to there? So that that's really been... Uh, the focus uh, of uh, my uh, thinking recently and, and over a longer horizon uh, as well. Governor Bernard, do you see a trend or at least an increased likelihood of a lessening in international regulatory cooperation among the G20 countries going forward? and the trend toward each country wanting more capital in its borders and each country going it alone? So um, I certainly think, uh, you know, putting on my old hat, um, uh, when I was responsible uh, at the Treasury Department for negotiating some of the international agreements um, that led to more harmonization, um, I certainly think it's in um, America's interest uh, that we do um, uh, level the playing field to the greatest extent possible and level up that playing field internationally. Um, you know, we learned uh, in the crisis, we've learned through uh, several crises right now that um, uh, we are not immune to financial instability uh, abroad, particularly in some of the larger financial jurisdictions. We've seen that in the last uh, few years um, when concerns about uh, banks that may uh, not have uh, had sufficient capital reverberated into our financial markets at a time when our banks uh, were actually building capital and, and looking uh, a lot healthier. So it matters uh, to our financial uh, resilience and the, and the uh, health of our economy um, that uh, financial institutions abroad um, are just as, uh, you know, just as uh, risk tested uh, just as well capitalized, husbanding their liquidity just as carefully uh, as U.S. institutions are. Uh, it's, it's simply, um, uh, it's, it seems to me, uh, simply uh, self-interest to make sure uh, that the uh, world uh, is working together around a set of, um, you know, uh, sort of similar uh, uh, regulations that, that look a lot like the ones we have here. Thank you very much. Um, you, let's go back to the international, if it's if it's okay. Um, I worry about how much growth internationally, and especially look at Europe, for example, is really due to so much central bank liquidity versus fundamental issues. So, for example, in Europe, we all know that there's still, and, and I, I realize the IMF came out with their, you know, more um, positive reports, but we all know that the real structural reforms have not really been fully implemented. Um, the NPLs are very high still in many of those countries. And I worry in particular about the emerging economies where one of the reasons they were not impacted negatively during the most previous crisis was because they had really revised their debt management strategies, largely, you know, local currency as opposed to U.S. dollar currency. 
um, as well as extending the duration and so on. Um, but we have seen more laterally because of low rates, um, they have really um, have increased not only on the corporate level, but also in the, uh, at the government level, um, US dollar denominated debt again. So I worry, A, have the fundamental structural issues been resolved, and B, what's gonna happen with all these emerging economies who now have uh, lots of US dollar denominated debt as normalization occurs, as dollar you know, get, increases yeah. again, um, is this all setting up for sort of an unhappy ending? So um, the kinds of um, risks that you pointed to, I think, are ones um, that you know have been highlighted uh, by some of the um, financial stability reports that international organizations have done. It's certainly something that uh, we think a lot about um, potential uh, financial uh, spillovers into the U.S. market and try to figure out where those risks may come from. Um, there is uh, a risk uh, in uh, environments such as this um, that um, you could see um, behavior that uh, does lead to financial imbalances and um, there's a risk that uh, you could see complacency that leads to uh, a slowing down of structural reforms. Obviously, um, you know, we, we uh, think that the reverse uh, is, is preferable, and that's why here in the U.S. again, you know, we put in place a number of difficult structural reforms in the financial system. Um, that process uh, was a difficult and challenging process, um, but now that we're on the other side of it, I think we uh, can uh, feel somewhat more confident um, that there are guardrails and uh, risk uh, buffers in the economy that should serve us well. And, um, and I would hope that other uh, countries uh, move forward on the same kinds of structural reforms um, it, so that we also would see less uh, risks abroad. So I think that is our last question. Um, thank you so much. It's nice to see everybody. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Governor. That was uh, that was terrific. Uh, particularly the the, the Q and A, and um, and it's clear to I think all of us that you're going to play an important role uh, for many years to come in Washington. So we'll look forward to welcoming you back uh, to the Economic Club of New York, and again in the future. Thank you. Um, so just a reminder to the to the group, we have um, plenty of activities coming up. Uh, beginning tomorrow, we have uh, the chairman of the National Association of Manufacturers and also chairman of, uh, he happens to be chairman and CEO of Emerson Electric. His name is David Farr, so he'll be talking about jobs in, in the manufacturing sector. Um, then in um, uh, October, uh, October 5th, we have Henry Kaufman. He's got a new book, uh, Tectonic Shifts in Financial Markets. He'll be talking about that. Um, uh, 17th of October, we have the CEO of uh, CVS. Lots going on in that business. Um, that's quite transformational. And then, very busy uh, November, uh, Jan Smets is the governor of the National Bank of Belgium. Uh, Bill Dudley, we know, our former chairman of the club and uh, chairman and CEO of the uh, New York Federal Reserve Bank. We have Ginny Rimetti, who's the chairman and CEO of IBM. Doug McMillan, uh, president and CEO of Walmart. Uh, Randall Stevenson, chairman uh, and CEO of, of AT&T. So, uh, so a, a big lineup, and then in December we have Henry Kissinger, our, our, one of our members, of course, and, uh, and Henry will be uh, talking to us in, in December. So a very good, good lineup. Hope you all have a, a great return to work uh, today, and thanks for being here. Bye-bye.